Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So uh, first off, I just want to express immense gratitude to my fellow panelists here, um, and as well to our um, thoughtful thought leader, Daniel Tucker, for bringing us together. Um, you know, as as someone who has tried to be a part of um, important conversations, especially around the intersection of art and social justice, um, it, it was you know incredibly nourishing to be able to have a chance to speak, but also to be in a room where there's so many people who have laid the groundwork for the city to be put on the map for this conversation. And so hopefully as we talk about our projects, um, also want to make sure to acknowledge those folks in the room who continue to open up the city as a space for critical thought um, around these issues. So I'm a co-founder of Monument Lab. I'm the artistic director now. Um, and many of you may know Monument Lab as a citywide public art and history exhibition um, that was produced with Mural Arts Philadelphia last fall. Um, but Monument Lab began about six years ago in a series of classroom conversations. Um, the other co-founder, Ken Lum, and I were both teaching um, at Penn. I had grown up in Philadelphia, left for seven years, and then came back. Um, and it was really seeing uh, Zoe Strauss's show at the PMA, 10 years, that kind of, um, kind of lit a fire a little bit for me to think about this moment in the city. It felt as if it was a moment of arrival, of cultural intrigue, of, of energy in the city, and also of ongoing challenge and crisis and inequality. And Zoe's show at the PMA was one of the spaces that I felt like that ambivalence could be captured together. Ken Lum was new to the city of Philadelphia by way of Vancouver, um, but had started taking walks around Philadelphia and noting at that point, as he said, a kind of hierarchy, an unofficial one of public monumentality, where John Wanamaker has a statue on the apron of City Hall, uh, but Billie Holiday has a plaque. And the two of us started thinking with our students about what kinds of public art represented complex histories, especially around race, gender, sexuality, class, and national belonging. Um, and what was missing, what narratives were sanctioned, what narratives were pushed aside, and then also how have artists, writers, poets, cultural figures bridged the gap between what is represented in public space and what is nonetheless known and inscribed in public memory so that particular stories, especially of struggle, can be brought into public consciousness. Our first steps when we tried to take this out from the classroom, um, thanks to support from the Pew Center for a Discovery Grant, was to build a prototype monument in the center of City Hall, to open up a research lab. And for us, rather than coming up with a thesis about what the show or what our project really should and could be, we wanted to come up with a question. And the question was, what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? We wanted a question that didn't have a winner, we wanted a question that would, um, on some ways, be necessary to kind of chew on, but that the notion of appropriateness could be appropriated by anyone who had an idea and lived in the city. Um, the first project that we built, a prototype monument, it was monumental not because it was permanent or universal, but because it was placed in the center of City Hall, was Terry Atkins, um, the, the late great um, artist. His empty classroom, that he said the appropriate monument for the city of Philadelphia was an empty classroom because we're known for our educational pride, our great institutions, but also for school closures and budget cuts. And Terry's project also captured that ambivalence, not being wishy-washy, not having no opinion, but that pull between multiple directions. And in many ways, our project would not be possible without Terry's input, Terry's vision. Um, Terry proposed his project um, and two days later passed away. And you get a sense of the kind of generative nature, not just of artists' works, but of even monuments that they speak past their time. Adjacent to Terry's sculpture was a learning lab where students, 
public historian, a social worker, worked and tried to capture conversations and make records of them, to make archives of living memory that would live on in the city. And that opening phase was incredibly powerful for us. Mural Arts was one of our partners, but together we kind of thought through what would it mean to open up this project on a larger basis, to fill the five squares of the original Penn's plan, right? This is a city mapped before it was built, inhabited before it was settled, and also push that out into neighborhoods as well. Um, and so thanks to support from a lot of folks, including Pew and William Penn, we're able to push that out to have prototype monuments with learning labs where high school students and local artists and educators were paid, and college students at Penn, Haverford, Bryn Mawr, and Swarthmore got college credit to be working at the labs, and it was a very deliberate choice. I would say that in many ways, and we'll get into this through this conversation, that the work of 20 artists, some of whom were from Philadelphia, some of whom became closely aligned with the city or with neighborhoods, um, pushed us at every stage. The artists imagined monuments that were traditional, that were towering, but others that were poetic, ephemeral, um, and drew attention to absences, to gaps, to, in many ways, our shortcomings on our monumental landscape. The work of the students was profound. The interactions that they had, the interactions that they shared, that'll be pulled into uh, future publications out of this project, um, keep pushing us. And then finally, the participants. Um, over 200,000 engagements occurred around the city through the project, face to face. And while this was a project that had a, you know, it was important for us to have social media conversations to extend beyond the city, it was those face to face engagements that mattered most. Um, out of those, close to 5,000 public proposals were gathered um, to think about monuments. Some of them mirror the kind of monuments that we see in the city and other great public art, but others call attention to the traumas, the wounds, the challenges the humor, the discernment, the criticality, and the project would not have been possible without all of that. And so as we gather here tonight, in part what our hope is to do is to be part of citywide conversations happening in multiple institutions with multiple people, um, and to be another chapter, and ultimately kind of follow through on our goal, which was lofty, but we wanted to make a dent in, which was um, to change the ways that we write the history of our city together. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Paul. Um, so now we're going to move on to Damon, who's going to talk to us about Philadelphia Symbol. Yeah. So um, Philadelphia Symbol was slash is a, a large scale project that brought about 160 collaborators together um, to amplify the work that was being done across the city. Um, around maybe five major concerns to really thinking about these topics of reconstruction, of sovereignty, of sanctuary, of the future, and of movement. Um, and all of this kind of started with an initiating artist, Jonathan Heisvag, who was invited uh, from the museum to come in to do a project here. Um, I don't know if anyone knew exactly what that would mean uh, when, when she was first invited here, but it, it started out as a series of conversations and grew into this, this colossal project. So she literally spent three years in the city meeting with people, having conversations, and ending each one with the question of who else should I talk to? Who else should I meet? Who can you introduce me to? Um, and always sitting on this question of what are you thinking about? What are you concerned about? What are the urgencies that are going on in your mind? What are you working on? And through that process, these words of reconstruction, sovereignty, sanctuary, Futures, movement, all of those came out of those conversations. So from the very beginning, the project grew very organically with a team of people. Um, and once those sort of urgencies, those atmospheres were defined, the next step was starting to pull together a team. So I was one of the editors on the project. Um, and that, that initial group of collaborators, this, this core group of editors, as we call ourselves, were the ones that helped sort of organize the, the different atmospheres, to so organize the working groups and brought people together to, to think about these questions. Um, but again, at its heart, it really was about amplifying the work that already existed in the city, 
So it wasn't about creating new projects or sort of starting from scratch. It was really saying, what are you working on? And what's the voice that we could lend to that? How can we, we highlight that? What are the new networks of communication that could happen at Dins, uh, across multiple concerns that people are addressing? Um, it had three major phases. So after a series of conversations where the editors were coming together, where we established our working groups, uh, we were meeting bi-monthly for um, about a year, early year and a half. And then we started with what we called the city-wise, or the public phase. Um, and we did over, I'm looking at Phoebe, over 70 plus programs throughout the city, um, over a series of about seven to eight different sites. So we, we took those, those spaces in the city where people, again, were already doing this work, were already thinking about these concerns, and really brought attention to them through different actions, um, everything running from teach-ins to demonstrations to actions to a street fair to just a wide variety of performances uh, readings poetry installations kind of really running the gamut uh, and then there was a move-in phase where we worked with a couple artist collectives to really think about how do we take some of this discussion and conversation that was happening throughout the city and bring it into the art museum so i mean i think traditionally when you think about an exhibition going up there's kind of a period where the gallery closes the lights sort of go off and the lights come back on and suddenly there's a new amount of objects and an arrangement in the white cube. So this was really about honoring that process of bringing these stories and this work, because again, I will say this a lot, but this is work that was already being done, so how do you honor that fact and actually find a way to bring it into the museum and appreciate what that means to bring these stories into a space? Um, and then the final phase was actually an exhibition at the, the Perlman Noy. So it really kind of took over the entire first floor, from the auditorium to the different gallery spaces to, in fact, the kitchen, and turning over the kitchen to our collaborators as well, changing the menu, changing the wall color, the, the tables that were in the space, um, the method which, in which we invited guests into to the building, the kind of conversations we would have, um, how we interacted at the visitor service window, all of that was transformed by collaborators coming in and truly owning the space for about a three month period. Um, and now that that is wrapped up, the, we're, we're sort of figuring out where the next process is, and we'll get into that a little bit more too, but it's, it's a network that continues to grow and sort of um, have a life beyond just sort of that, that experience of exhibition. Great, thanks Damon. Um, so now we'll hear from May. He's going to talk about speech acts. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Kind of? Okay. Um, well, first off, uh, ditto to everything Paul said, so I don't have to say it again. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, Daniel, and everyone. Uh, so I'm here uh, representing kind of the show I curated in the fall called Speech Acts. I'm a relatively young and new curator. Um, I moved here in June of 2016. I'm the first uh, black full curator at the ICA. Um, is shameful on the museum and most museums in, in the nation, um, just to start out with. But um, I wanted to curate a show that was looking at experimental poetry. And one of the ways that I kind of came to it was, it was not the show I wanted to curate. Um, I wanted to curate another show that opens tonight um, in Chicago um, by Audubon Nkenga. She's an amazing uh, Nigerian artist. And when I approached her, she said, I'm sorry, I'm doing a retrospective with the MCA. And I said, oh shit, I have to come up with another show. And so I was laying on my couch and I was looking at my poetry collection and I had worked years ago for Northwestern University in which Nikki Finney's Head Off and Split had come out. If no one's read it, it is a fantastic book. I really recommend it. It's interesting in Southern poetry. Um, and I was suddenly realizing that a lot of artists that I'm very close to, uh, Martine Sims being one of them, she's a staple artist that I've worked with, um, were working with experimental poetry. And I started thinking I'm a young person that has never curated a show. I'm having this first floor opportunity at the ICA and I have a year to put together a show. What could I do and what is something that I could curate that is in conversation with every show that's kind of happening right now in the past like five, six years? So thinking about MoMA's exhibition on um, experimental language. Um, the same year there was an exhibition of, of this past year at the Getty about concrete poetry. I see Boston had had a poetry show, and yet all of them only had one or two black artists, usually Glenn Ligon, Adam Pendleton. And I just thought, you know, this is, this is unbelievable. Black poetry is incredibly important. Um, how have we not had a show before? So I started formulating it, 
And I started talking to a couple of the artists, and um, Martine was one of the first I approached. She had a solo show this past year at MoMA, the second black woman in the history of the museum to have a solo show, um, which is absurd again. Um, and when I started talking to them, the artists started saying, well, have you considered so-and-so? Have you thought about this person? And it's completely shaped the way that I'm working as a curator. So I, you can't tell I'm a very social person, although I uh, talk a lot at work. And so I decided that I wanted to talk to a bunch of poets. So I was fortunate enough to talk to Fred Moten, Claudia Rankin, Nathaniel Mackey, Harriet Mullen, um, Nobrese Phillip, kind of all the leading stars of contemporary poetry that I wanted to talk to. And as I was talking to Harriet Mullen, um, if anyone's familiar with her work, she is a queer black poet uh, who was primarily writing in the 1980s. A lot of the poetry that I was interested in was coming after the black arts movement. Um, so this is 1980s post-structuralism, where a lot of people are suddenly saying, hey, I get it from the black arts movement, but we're queer people, we're marginalized people, we're affluent people. What are all the different voices in which the black community sort of exists within? Um, I was really interested in that group. And when I was talking to Harriet, she said something. I asked her about you know, her group of avant-garde poets, and she said, I'm not interested in the avant-garde. We're all thinking about the future. And it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, I'm talking to people that use the avant-garde constantly. So what does it mean to have a relational practice? So the artists within the show are born between 1981 and 1988. Um, everyone knows each other. Everyone is a friend. Um, all of them have kind of been in communication. It's Martine Sims, Camila Janan Rashid, um, Tony Lewis, Stephanie Jamison, um, who am I forgetting? Yeah. Uh, Jibide Khalil Huffman and Tiana Nikia McLaughlin. And we worked with three poets in the group. Uh, the first two poets were Morgan Parker, um, who had just published their More Beautiful Things Than Beyonce, and Simone White, um, who had just published, what was her book then? She has a brand new book coming out, but um, of being dispersed with Future Poem. And when I approached the poets, I just asked them would they write some type of poetic response. I, didn't, I had no idea what the show was going to be. I called it a black poetry show for a long time. And suddenly I returned to the work of Richard Iton, who's a, a late professor uh, in black studies um, at Northwestern, and he had written a chapter on the black arts movement, and the subchapter was called speech slash acts. And I was really attracted to this idea of a speech act, which is coming from J.L. Austin, uh, who's a linguistic theorist, interested or not, um, probably not. Um, so thinking about a speech act is as simple as hello. Um, it is something that is performed, it is interpreted, and I wanted to think what does it mean for myself, a black woman, a black queer woman in this space, to wield power? Uh, what does it mean for me to give power to a group of people? And I wanted to give it to a group that I thought um, were particularly marginalized thinking about uh, predominantly women, predominantly queer people. Um, but I also was really interested in this act of listening as well. So ACT comes up a lot. Um, that's a general gist of the show, but I do want to take up as much space as everyone else on the panel. And so I'd like to just read for a minute uh, from the new catalog, which is coming out. And so this is just a quick paragraph from the book. And it says, kind of talking about the fallibility of language. I was really inspired by the work of Don Lundy Martin. She teaches out of um, uh, University of Pennsylvania. She's co-founded a poetics workshop. And it says, um, this is my me speaking right now. Language fails everyone in some capacity, but I'm particularly interested in how it fails in naming us as black people. Throughout my research for this exhibition, I have often turned to the work of poet Don Lundy Martin. To be accurate, I have mainly returned to the second stanza from a bleeding and autobiographical tale, from which one of the epigraphs is taken. The stanza begins by asking, which language rankles, unsettling the tub of tummy, sith, froze, sentence, Fabric that is not fabric, a need for unrecognizable speech. I find myself often thinking about this notion of unrecognizable speech. It insists on a language that abstracts, one that does not bind, label, or organize. If language fails in its narrow definition of blackness, it might be useful for us to think of the non-representational as a place of accuracy. What happens when we refuse a language that has never been able to recognize us? So starting with the text and kind of thinking through that, um, the show builds, and then if anyone has seen the show, then you know that there's a classroom space within it, and the classroom space is part of Claudia Rankine's Racial Imaginary Institute. It was founded when she received the MacArthur Fellowship. I'm a curator um, of that practice as well. And we decided to have a classroom space in which Penn, uh, an amazing professor of Brooke O'Hara did a performance 
a class taught every Thursday, and then we did a reading group that also uh, functioned every other Saturday. So there's about 15 programs that came and were part of that. Awesome. Thanks, May. Um, and now we'll hear from Rob about Symphony for Broken Orchestra. Um, and I just want to do a double ditto to really really think, I guess, what Meg and Paul had my, my voice of that chorus of you know, all the people in Philly who for, for generations have been putting the work out there in the public sphere so that we can do the work that we're doing now and those who have been doing it, we need to do so. It's, it's a fun city to do these kind of projects. At least I found it that way. Um, so the 74 Broken Orchestra project, <clears throat> I need to rewind it a little bit and talk first about an artist named Papana Storio. Um, he's an artist who has been on Temple Contemporary's advisory council. And this is a council comprised of about 35 folk, ranging from uh, kids of color who live in the neighborhood um, that shows the Tyler, um, the Tyler School of Art at Temple, um, through to students at Temple, and then um, civic and cultural leaders across the city. And the way the advisory council works is that everybody comes to a meeting and brings a question that they care deeply about but don't know the answer to. And Papon brought this question about a school on the Fairhill Elementary School that he writes his book as, as he's on his way to teach at Tyler. And his question was quite simple. Like He says, I think this school is now up for sale. What's going on? Um, and that opened this can of worms, um, which eventually became a project called The Form. But it, it was a project that Temple Contemporary voted, the advisory council voted for, and so we, we worked with to create on um, of the Peace Center for Arts and Heritage. But it forced um, myself and our associate director, Sarah B. Miller, to start touring all of the 23 plus schools that the school district of Philadelphia closed in 2013. And as part of those tours, we walked into this gymnasium that was full of uh, broken pianos. And it was like, like 30 pianos. And you know, it was, in a way, it was it was it was tragically beautiful because on those pianos, the music teachers had sort of taped on reminders to the students that they could read, so it would keep them practicing and stuff. And things like "You were born an original, don't die a copy," you know, stuff like this that the kids are looking at. And then their school gets closed. Um, so we started doing some digging around this because they couldn't get these pianos out of their mind. And reached out to the school district and said, how many broken instruments are there? And that revealed that in 20, 2007, there was a budget for um, the School District of Philadelphia's Instrumental Music Program and the Arts in General for $1.3 million. And 10 years forward, in 2017, that budget was $50,000 for the entire school district. So you can see how you know a kid you know, just learning the tuba in marching band practice and trips, and there goes the tuba. There's just no money available to fix those instruments. And so these teachers had been amassing what they called, almost kind of like a gallows humor kind of way, instrument graveyards of just instruments that were being stockpiled that they had no budget to fix. And they would try. I mean, I don't mean to disparage the school district music teachers in any way. Like, you, we got instruments you know, held together with sellotape and all kinds. It was kind of, it was kind of really sad. Um, but we made a promise to those teachers, um, Anna Jozowski, she's in the audience today, um, uh, she and the rest of the people, some contemporary with like two, um, who we basically promised the researchers, like, look, bring us your broken instruments and we'll figure out a way to, to, um, to repair them and to do something beautiful with them. And through this process, the, the school district teachers, they came, uh, in droves, they came with their cars, you know, like packed full of broken instruments and all this kind of stuff. We, we got over a thousand broken instruments. And um, through that work, um, I commissioned a composer named David Lang and said to him, look, I want you to write something for the sounds that these broken instruments can make. And so he wrote uh, this piece called Simply for Broken Instruments um, for the project. And uh, we rec Anna recruited over, I think it was 385 musicians from across the city. So you had 12-year-old kids playing next to you, members of the Philadelphia Orchestra on this performance um, that we had in the Armory, I think there's an image point back around that, um, in December of last year. And then through the website, when all those instruments were brought in, we photographed them, recorded them, made a website where you could adopt an instrument, and we raised over a quarter million dollars 
so that all of those instruments can be fixed. Um, and some of them are so far gone that they really have to be replaced. And so we, thankfully that money is also going towards the replacement of those instruments. So we're going to return them all back to the school district to those kids in the fall of 2018 for the start of the school year. Um, uh, and I think there'll be, I think there will still be a cushion of cash so that <clears throat> the school district will still have money available so that when that kid Fall again, sadly. Um, there'll be something there um, to take that up with. Um, I should also say that we, uh, thanks to support from the Barrett Foundation, we're putting instrument repair kits for the most minor repairs because some of these, like the saxophone, is missing a pad. Like, that's actually a really easy fit if the teacher just has the right thing and has a video tutorial to watch. So, those like quick repairs can happen in the classroom with the instrument repair kits that we're putting in every school that uses instrument music across the district. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is sort of dance around some questions together. And, um, and the questions really emerge out of conversations that, uh, that I've been having with the panelists over the last month or so. And, um, you know, I can say a little bit of backstory, you know, for me teaching, <coughs> teaching a more this fall while all these projects was going on, were going on was sort of was such a gift because basically this was just became the curriculum um, and we just like went to all these projects or it had some interaction in some way um, and so it was um, so that was really helpful um, thanks to you all um, and and so one of the things so so I was able to experience them all which was also a gift um, and and I see that there's some points of connection, and then obviously, as you heard from the sort of outline, outline, rough outlines of, the, of this work, they're also really complicated and really different from one another, too. And so the way that we're going to approach these questions is that all of these folks can answer all of the questions, but you do not have to. But if you don't answer enough questions, then I'll call on you. Okay? That's so just get some, so we get some even coverage. All right. So don't if you're just like that question doesn't apply. You don't have to jump in, but just jump in enough so that you're representing yourself. Okay. So um, so what I wanted to kind of kick off with um, was some something that, that struck struck me in in uh, hearing about this work was that some of this stuff had had really long lead time. Right, and that that's what it takes to, to do kind of you know big ambitious projects. It takes a long time, and sometimes a long time is a year, and sometimes it's five years. Right, and and so there's uh, you know there's uh, different um, different time frames for each of these. But I'd love to hear you all talk about sort of how you balance planning and basically following through with an ambitious plan and engaging in the conversations of the moment. I think the word for that is second guess. Um, engaging in the conversation at the moment, in, engaging in what what kind of emerged in that uh, in that period of time in which you were actually unfurling this this work in in the world with your collaborators. So maybe I'll start. Um, I mean, I think for us, the thing about Philadelphia Symbol was is that or is. Um, Yes, it took about five years for the project to maybe take the form that people saw, but again, it was about work that started long before that and is continuing long after that. So this is what people were doing in their day-to-day -day lives. This is what their work is. This is what their, their practice is. Um, you know, there was definitely artists a part of it, that were part of the project, but this was also community organizers. These were activists. These are. Um, people with a variety of jobs and a variety of interests. So it's, this, this is what people were doing. This is, this is their day-to-day -day existence. So th there was a, a long time of planning around this sort of basic structure and knowing that we had these three phases coming up, knowing that we had to think about what was going to happen during the citywide phase, what was the movement going to look like, what was going to happen, that something had to come back to the museum at some point. But in terms of, the creation of objects or the planning of programs, none of that had enough time. That all happened very much in the moment and it was responsive to what was going on. 
Um, and I think in, in our conversation that we had on the phone leading up to this, I mean, for our collaborators, um, the election was a huge turning point. It, it changed a lot of what people were doing. There was projects that were planned that didn't go through because people no longer felt safe to do those projects, those actions that we had sort of planned. Um, I mean, for instance, one thing that comes to mind, we had planned an event called and the Icebreaker, which was going to be a block party in front of Immigration Customs and, and Enforcement. And then as new policies started coming down and new discussions were having, the population, I think within like two days before we were going to do that event, said, we, we, can't, we can't do this now. We don't feel safe. It doesn't feel comfortable. So the plan was changed. We, we didn't get to do that. It got pushed back. We you know, had to be responsive. And, and when I say we, I'm talking about the large collective we of 160 collaborators. I mean, there was no sort of like we, the museum, kind of talking to the community and saying, like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? It was really like the collaborators saying together as a whole, this is no longer the appropriate action to do, so what can we do instead? So I think just in general, the election became this turning point because some collaborators dug down, I think, more intently, and the questions that we were, were talking about became that much more important and that much more urgent. Others pulled back because they're like, I have actual work to do right now. That we have populations and communities that we have to protect, that we have to be thinking about, that we have to, to go into serious work mode. I mean, there, was, there were protests and there were demonstrations that some became naturally enfolded into what the project was doing, and then others that it wouldn't have been appropriate for us to try to attach this other label and this other discussion to. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a weird answer. It just, it was always a part of what we were doing. Can I do that too? Yeah. You know, I mean, in many ways, our work was attempting to tap into deep currents of time and history in the city, and also to urgent issues. Um, but kind of an attempt to answer your question, I want to think about a particular moment, which was last August, um, right after the um, tragic events and, and alarming events in Charlottesville around the Robert E. Lee statue that, um, as far as I know, is, is still standing but covered in a, um, a, a black tarp. And, you know, for Mining the Lab, we had been working on it for six years. We had been responding to artists and activists for generations, but especially over the last five years, who had utilized the monumental landscape in order to call for urgent issues and change. And that included Black Lives Matter activists, that included feminist and queer activists. Um, and so for us, it's, we felt in many ways that we were late to the conversation. But of course, after what happened in Charlottesville um, with um, you know Nazis marching through the streets and a lot of physical violence and the, and the, the murder of one um, anti-racist protester, the, the drama and the spectacle and the reality that our monuments have been telling us, have not been telling us the full truth about our, our society. The, the reinforcement of white supremacy especially was brought to the surface. For a number of people, many of whom are white, who had not grappled with these were understandings that, again, a lot of a lot of people, and as led by communities of color, activists and artists, have been drawing attention to. So, I, I mean, what happened in August, in many ways, was an opportunity, but also an, an immense duty for us, because I think when you're promoting an exhibition, and there were a number of people around us that would say this, like, "Oh, wow, like, aren't you lucky?" And you know, when there's immense pain. And trauma that goes along with that moment, you have to really figure out how to step to it in the right way. And so what happened is, in my experience, was that there were um, a number of people who, a number of, of white people, reporters, arts administrators, curators, who were talking about white supremacy and public space in ways that I hadn't heard them. There were ways that, you know, as a white Jewish queer curator, I had been learning from and working with collaborators from marginalized communities 
Um, but I had to push myself to make sure that, you know, the, the work had to speak to these issues. <coughs> Whenever the local news would show up, um, and they did after um, Hank Willis Thomas's All Power to All People went out and tried to ask, like, well, is this about Rizzo? Um, as in the Rizzo statue in the last few weeks. And we had to use that opportunity to say, actually, this is deep about wounds related to Rizzo's legacy from before the moment he was a statue to the statue's dedication itself. And so, you know, I think what it end ended up happening was that the idea that our monuments have not told us the full truth, the idea that our monuments have been only part of the story, the idea that we need to kind of understand what monuments we've inherited and shape a new generation of monuments were brought up to the fore. But at each moment, it was <coughs> necessary to understand that the moment was not new, that the moment we were stepping into and had to do it with um, humility and um, a sense of weight as well. I guess thinking about time, I had a much shorter lead time than everyone else, but I was really surprised. Um, the speech action was the first show I ever curated, so my family and friends came out like it was a wedding. Um, so I got a lot of gifts, and I had friends from all over the world come out. And so I was really surprised to hear people say that the ideas I had been thinking about kind of culminated in speech acts in this way that I don't think about. I mean, I definitely think about my practice, but like. I wasn't necessarily thinking that there was a longer term conversation that I was having that sort of led to this. Um, given that I had a little under a year, um, I am pretty organized, but I'm also uh, chronically ill and I'm a person that uh, usually gets very ill under stress. And so I did purposely plan to have lots of things done beforehand leading up to the show opening. So a lot of my initial writing actually took place in the very first months of the show. And I would just recommend to any other curators or young people that are trying to get into that, like it was super helpful just to have some ideas jotted down. I'm shocked to hear, like read my writing and see some of those initial ideas come forward. Um, I was, everyone was like, I cannot believe how chill you are with an opening coming right now. I microdose shrooms the first like the two weeks leading up to it. So like <laughs> I was feeling great, but like, I think planning and knowing that one was potentially going to face illness at this time in which you're incredibly stressed, putting any show together is stressful no matter what scale, um, was super helpful for to, to me. But I also hope that I'm in an institution at some point in which I get a lot of time to prepare and plan for a project as well. I'll just jump in quickly to say that um, <clears throat> I think a lot of us suspect like how, how deep in the hopper the school district is but for us to make a call out to those teachers and invite them to bring their broken instruments and to actually see the challenge that they're faced with was our way of maybe contributing in some respect to that idea of the zeitgeist in terms of like this was a public public moment to actually bear witness on what the teachers who are teaching our next generation of varsity artists are dealing with on a daily basis. Thanks. Um, so my next question, uh, in a way, sort of deals with the the, um, the fact that all these projects had tons of events. Um, and so on just on some like practical level, you were just like, whoa, I could just go to these four projects all fall, and that would be the only thing I would do in my life. Um, but um, so th there's sort of that practical observation. But on another level, that's the event organizing is also somehow like increasingly a part of the, the skill set of of a curator or the sort of you know the expectation of um, of an of an organization or an institution that is producing um, these kind of projects oftentimes is bringing people in right through events um, as well as some of the stuff that you all uh, discussed sort of mark marking um, time and engaging people through a process of events that sort of long long exceed any kind of conventional exhibition timeline. Um, so I'm just curious if you all could talk a little bit about sort of your, the ways in which you kind of engaged in event organizing um, as part of the, you know, as part of the kind of creative practice um, and ways that that also sort of pushed, it pushed the culture of the, the institutions or the spaces that you were operating and ways in which it sort of made use 
of it as well. Um, so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think for me, um, it was several factors. My chief carrier said, do not over, over plan this show, which I said, sure. And then I had like 15 programs. Um, a lot of that came down to a couple factors, um, one being the fact of uh, the, fab, the like absolutely amazing, fabulous uh, Mary Carmel Holmes was working at the IC at the time. Um, and we collaborated on a lot of the programming. She was our director of public engagement um, and recently left to work with Ava DuVernay. And um, so it was something where May and I had been talking about programs we wanted to do. And some of that was, you know, bringing big things like Claudio Rankin here uh, to Philly. Um, but then we started, as I had conversations with people and started talking about the show, lots of people wanted to start collaborating. And you know, you, at a museum, you have a pretty small budget uh, for a large, a large show. It's usually about three programs. Um, but Julia Block, um, who's the director of creative writing, offered to uh, do programs at Kelly Writer's House. I think the best program we had was about um, race and poetics uh, with John Keane, Dorothy Wang's book, uh, which was actually foundational to my thinking, um, and David Eng, and then Samuel Delaney showed up and sat in front of me for my first panel, which was like really mind blowing. But having something like that where all of us could sit and kind of talk about how experimental poetics and race uh, relate to each other, having people kind of come in and be part of the process actually made my project a lot better. Um, and I think it's something that I'm really thinking about now that I'm working on my next show. Um, I definitely thought, what were the strengths and things I liked about Speech Acts? And I, I can safely say Speech Acts is the first thing I've ever made that I truly love. I feel like incredibly proud of that show. And I think it is because um, all of the errors that I would have seen if I had done this by myself um, were pointed out to me very early. So as I'm currently working on my new project, I Skyped today with one of my good friends who works at the Tate, and she was like, I don't like your temporal framework. I think it's X, Y, and Z. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit on it, and I'm going to think about it, because I want to listen to people. Um, because oftentimes people um, have very good perspectives of how I'm thinking. And as much as I'm an ego-driven curator, I also want to kind of step back and say, OK, where's the breadth? Where are the ways in which other people are thinking about these topics? And the 15 programs are really a way in which we could we could engage that. I don't know if our museum is ever going to do that many programs again, but having a reading room and a syllabus to the show, the syllabus is more searchable than the show. Um, it was written up in more places than, I mean, the show was written up everywhere, but like the syllabus was often mentioned. Um, I've noticed when I talk to grantors now, they're always like, is there going to be a classroom? Are there classes being taught in the show? Are there syllabuses? So there are different ways in which you can engage. I'm just hoping not to replicate that so it becomes formulaic. Can I just add something real quick, Meg? Because one of the things that you, you mentioned in our, in our discussions was that, that something that characterized some of the programs was that oh, yeah. it felt like they were these yeah yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so uh two things first off i didn't get to see almost anyone's projects here on the panel so i should say i lived at the museum so i was absolutely exhausted by the end but one thing i did want to think about um was because i'm deeply close to the artists in the show quite a few of them gave me works at the at the end of it you know we still text each other i'm working with some of them now is how can we use programming as a way for us to build a conversation instead of singular uh, programs. So Camila, Tiana, people like that would be consistently in the museum. So I was practically at the museum every weekend. So whether I was hanging out with people or if I was doing a program, all of these people were in the mix. And there's a poet that's at Penn who worked on, on the project, Amber Rose Johnson and Davey Niddle. Um, both of them were part of the process that I kind of brought them in. And so even in the audience, suddenly they would be saying something and we would continue. Or our final, our final uh, program was at Triple Canopy in New York. And when we got on stage, I just said, you know, we've all been having this conversation for the past three months. We're not going to talk about the show in which the way you're expecting it. Um, we're going to start where we last left off. And that was thinking about the consumption of black bodies within an exhibition space. So it's a little jarring if you're suddenly jumping into a conversation. But I thought it was a way in which it was really fruitful for us as participants to not say the same lines over and over again. It was a way to kind of constantly approach these um, these positions, and it was a way in which um, we were really casual. Like, as if you can't tell how I talk already, but like, 
it's a way in which all of us can just kind of say, I'm really concerned about the way that black people are being exhibited. It's because of X, Y, and Z. And suddenly, two conversations later, someone will say, well, you brought up this in this prior conversation. So what happens for a generation to be in dialogue with each other, but also what does it mean to kind of display that and kind of be part of that? Thanks. Other folks want to take up this event question? If not, I got more. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more and then so then then I'm then I'm cut off and then it's on you all, okay? So have them ready and there's some people in the back that are gonna be passing mics. Okay, so last last one. Um, is so something that struck me when you were all kind of giving your, your intros um, was the way in which the the, the process based kind of curating that was happening or the process-based organizing. I know, I know you don't all necessarily sort of identify as, as um, sort of curators within a project, but just um, the way in which, you know, like a, like a question that started in the advisory group meeting that Rob mentioned led to reform, led to finding the instruments and yeah, yeah. So there's like kind of the story of the project, and then there's also these these processes like the asking of the questions, of um, asking who I should talk to next, uh, you know, in Philadelphia symbol. So I just kind of wanted to to sort of hear a little bit more thoughts about this sort of the that like almost kind of methodology of, of process based um, you know work and sort of pursue you know starting from from questions um, and and kind of how that also sort of sits with in a way, sort of the uh, different strategies that, that curators and organizers use both to, to sort of take something where they're um, sort of framing, there's one method where you know, you're framing an existing set of questions, right? You're saying, these are these artists or these are these people and they're doing something already and we're gonna sort of you know, put a frame around that and try and focus on that for a time versus sort of commissioning or producing new new culture, new projects, new conversations. So that's kind of sprawling, but I trust that you all will <laughs> yeah. make sense of it. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, so I think with Philadelphia Symbol, it existed somewhere in between all of those things. So I, I there wasn't a single methodology. I mean, that, that's sort of the thing. There was this kind of initial organizational structure to say that, we, again, we had these sort of three periods that we knew things were going to happen within. We knew we were going to have a team of ed editors who were going to bring working groups together, but then everything else after that was sort of open-ended. So different editors ran their working groups in different ways. Someone was very into consensus-based process decision-making. Others had a more sort of open conversational kind of approach. So everything grew. I, this sounds like a cliche, and I can say it like a thousand times, but everything grew very organically in different process. And I think that was actually part of it. So like when we think about how do we collectively imagine our, our or how do we imagine co our collective futures or our possible futures, and it was always this plural of futures because there isn't a singularity that we were trying to create. There wasn't a single method approach. There wasn't a single outcome. It was always about what are the possibilities and how do we learn and think and process together. And John was very they own the sort of phrase of like imagining the not yet or, or planning for the not yet. Um, and I think that's really came to the forefront in how everything sort of was organized. So, uh, you know, there, there was a bit of process in terms of like, especially when things were coming back to the museum, there are structures in place at the museum. If we're going to bring objects in the museum, we have to like go through process to make sure that they are safe, to make sure that they're, they're not going to get damaged, we have to keep account of all of these things. But even that was pushed to its utmost limit, and, and we questioned and examined again and again in different right, in different ways. So, you know, for for this project, it just didn't comfortably sit within anything, which I think is what made it so amazing. The question was, how can you, both as an individual collaborator, how can you, as um, from the artistic team that was sort of in quotes curating all this together and how can an institution that was sort of like saying this is an idea that we want to bring together relax all of those concerns to the best of our ability all those sort of structures and, and ideas and be honest about which ones we can't relax and have those conversations but allow for multiple possibilities to be existing at the same time 
in multiple spaces always and you know the answer is sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it's nauseating and sometimes it's crazy and hectic and sometimes it's a big party and and, and all of the above you know it was, it was both wonderful and exhausting and I look back at it and I don't understand how it happened it's, it, but it did you know and it, and it continues to grow with its own life. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Phoebe, who was our project coordinator and sitting in the audience. I don't understand how she's standing. Like, it's just to, to have survived this sort of crazy process to keep it wrangled in any way, shape, or form um, still blows my mind. Um, I'll just uh, to give a shout out to Boredom because uh, the way in which Temple Contemporary functions is through Boredom, in that I, I was trained as a curator, you know, to go to Milan and see something beautiful and then, you know, bring it back to Philly and all that crap. And I did that for years and years and years. And um, it's a successful model in a lot of ways. But I got bored with it. And so it was by inviting more people in and by asking questions that we care about that it really became a white knuckle ride for me in a way that I never anticipated that these questions would come to the surface. And, um, people from all different walks of life will start voting for them and say, you know, this is what I think is really right now of the greatest local relevance and international significance for Philadelphia. And to let that um, guide the process has really been um, a giver. In, in this kind of thinking about process and product um, and thinking about maybe other trajectories of choreographies. Um, I think back a few years ago, I curated a show that included a work by the artist Adrian Piper. Um, and this piece was called Everything Number Five. And, in, and the piece called, it, Adrian Piper is, not, uh, is an artist who said that she's not coming back to the United States. Um, she lives in exile in Berlin. And she called for um, opening up um, not just hanging something on the gallery wall, but punching a hole in that wall and creating a window, um, a clear window that reveals anything behind that wall. So if it's wiring, if it's dust, if it's insulation, and it includes the inscription, everything will be taken away. And the first time I worked on it was at the Goethe Institute in DC, and we were going back and forth, um, not as much with the artist, but with the uh, German administrator of the Goethe, who during the process of the show had admitted that like he, his father was a um, Nazi war criminal and that he um, yeah, was sitting there like talking to him about, can we punch a hole in your wall? And I was thinking, like this is kind of the project where an African-American woman artist who is an expat is pushing me to have this person in charge of a space actually remove something from the building temporarily and risk structural damage but to do so, that process mattered and that my job as a curator is to put, I can't put all of that context out to the public, but at least I have to put the effort into making this happen because it would be a pity if I just experienced it and we couldn't actually punch a hole in the wall. So I think about that with Monument Lab in the sense that um, when you're working in public, that process, that conversation, the will to impose an artist or even an artist organization's idea on public space, um, that process is going from the moment you bring it up, from the moment you do your site visit, um, the moment that project managers are investigating and opening up possibilities, and that you know if you're walking especially into a public square, you're seen from all sides. And um, even if you're walking with people who are kind of denizens of that space, or you yourself are um, a denizen of that space, it looks like you're up to something. And it's really a remarkable opportunity. It's, it's also something you have to think through that at every step, it is part of the process. Um, you know, I think about some of the work, especially of the project managers, I see two in particular, Maud and Maria here, who had to put that into action in every kind of conversation they had about the projects. Um, to think about, even if the, the proposal will not live in public space the way it was originally conceived, how do we make it work? And how do we make it work in a way that isn't either working a wound of a local community 
or um, you know representatives of that space, or at least pays attention to necessary <coughs> variation and iteration that happens to make art go well. And so I think a lot of you know in thinking about the idea of what do artists need to make great works, sometimes we think about all of the creative space that's possible, right? Like I want to take over the square, I want to take over this gallery. And what I kept learning from the artists that we worked with is they needed the parameter. They needed to know what was allowed, what was permissible, what was a line they could cross or couldn't cross. And then it was their job to push that boundary or to dance on it or to imagine things over that. You know, and so I think that process can yield so much that's powerful and to do it in public means that from the moment that you're there to the moment you take it away and even the conversations you'll have afterwards, that's the hard work as well. I mean, I can, I can talk if you'd like. Um, I guess thinking about process, I talked a bit about it. A lot of it has been very conversational, but I will say um, what is slightly different, I guess, about, about a bit of speech acts and maybe working at the ICA is it's a little less locally focused in certain ways. Um, I guess I'd be honest to say that I think we're locally, less locally focused. Um, and I, but I would say that I am, as a curator, deeply, deeply, deeply um, geared towards working with marginalized artists, kind of specifically black artists, that are not simply interested in, in thinking about blackness. Um, the show that I'm working on next um, is again working with a very similar generation, kind of my generation, um, that are really pushing against contemporary tr trends of thinking about figuration, which really came up in this show. Um, I kind of closed the show and the last thing I say in the catalog is actually kind of the impetus for the next project. And so I've been thinking a lot about how my practice doesn't necessarily have to be responsive to trends or sudden ideas. I really want it to be a little more um, theoretically focused and kind of specifically uh, growing out of each show and each conversation. And so the next project was uh, kind of struck by Stephanie Jameson, although she's not in the show, but the artists that I represent and work with um, that really inspire me and push me uh, to think critically um, are really thinking against marketplace trends, are thinking what it means to be within institutions. Um, if anyone heard this this week, uh, the ICA was the first museum to be wage certified. Um, so we're totally transparent of what our operating budget is. Um, we are transparent about what we're paying all the artists. Um, and it's something that all of us have been fighting for for a really long time. And so the artists that I'm working with, uh, Cameron Rollin, uh, Carolyn Lazard, who's based in Philly, Cameron's from Philly, um, but as well as Martine Sims, as a jumping off point again, um, and Sable Ellis Smith, and then the curator, um, Monique Scott, who we're working with the Penn, Penn Museum Collection. I think a lot of those things, again, were coming out of speech acts and kind of where those initial conversations were saying, oh, I'm having trouble uh, thinking about, you know, maybe Dana Schutz's painting in the Whitney Biennial. I think the Whitney Biennial was a huge jumping off point and having someone like Hannah Black write a letter in which a lot of older black artists were really mad at a young generation, I've kind of decided instead of, of scolding, I've decided to kind of embrace my peers and say, you know, what's going on within these institutions and how can we work uh, with some ethics, um, making sure that we're transparent about how we're paying people, we can be transparent about what our working process is, that we can meet people with disability and say, yes, if you need more time, whatever you need, I'm going to try and advocate for you. And I think for me, the process really comes back to um, what it means to be an artist and, or to, to support artists. And I think seeing the firing of someone like Helen Molesworth, although I think it's incredibly complicated, makes you realize that a lot of museums and institutions out there are about collectors and are about their board and are not about supporting visions of people. And so as much as I'm excited to be up here talking to you today, I'm up here because I'm really incredibly privileged to be a black woman in 2018 in a museum who is with the most fantastic artists that I'm incredibly excited about. So thank you so much. Thank you. So now it's that time, Q&A time. And maybe what we can do is collect a couple questions too um, at, at once so that, that then everyone has a little chance to think about it for a second. So mics in the back, people have questions, please raise your hand so somebody can hand you a mic. Here's one. 
about the role that collateral played in your various projects. I'm thinking about the Monument Lab newspaper and how that can help promote surprising conversations, but also maybe if you're new to the project, maybe it's overwhelming that it's been so long in the making. Can you talk more about the legacies for your project in the moment and how collateral plays a role? And is there another one or two we can take? question about collateral. Um, yeah. question down here? And so just as you're thinking, ephemera in the expanded sense, documentation. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if each of you, or whoever wants to, I'll look in this one, um, can speak about um, whether or not you feel like you realize the intention of the work, right? Um, I think, particularly in a context where you're talking about social change and its intersection with art and culture, um, it's usually led with some form of intention of message or issue or movement. So if you can speak to that, that'd be great. Can you all want to take these up? <clears throat> um, I'll try to address both, but I think both questions asked um, point in different directions. I think in, in terms of um, collateral or ephemera or documentation, um, and, and our project's not alone in this, that there's a lot of material meant to be consumed in a lot of different ways, in, in large part trying to open up possibilities for engagement that does not involve someone spending a lot of time with you, someone having to read all the books that you've read, someone who um, is passing by. We are doing a publication with Temple University Press. We are book people, but we also knew that, especially in experimental projects outside, that we wanted to have kind of frame the whole project in something that Someone did not need to stop their feet moving in order to pick it up. So we tried it with our first project um, in, in the first phase in 2015. We printed the newspapers at Bartash and um, Grace Ferry. And it was not just economical, but it opened up a lot of possibility. And for us, we always kind of joked about this, but we were serious that we wanted to see the publication taken seriously. We wanted it to be read. We wanted to kind of name complicated um, issues and ideas in it, but if we saw it rolling across the streets as tumbleweed, we'd know that it became part of the city. And, um, you know, I think the, the newspaper was one of those um, tools. I also think about some of the, the great kind of takeaways from Philadelphia Assembled and other projects where the work of engagement clearly could have happened before, but it continues afterward as well. We use that just to pivot to um, that question about social change and I, I and also the notion of intention. And um, I, you know, I, I, I also felt that feeling of overwhelm, like we're still kind of coming down off of all of the, the activities of the show. There are ways that I do feel that we've hit some of our intentions about sparking conversation, about reaching numbers, about putting artists to work and students to work. But, you know, I also, of course, think about what's next. And in many ways, when we started the project, we didn't imagine that we would necessarily have the audience of many people and or many people in power to make decisions, for example, about public art or about monuments. And over time, that's shifted to people who make decisions about what gets put into bronze, what gets put into marble, what gets decided and where financial resources go, that we're at least part of the conversation or can find our way in the door. In terms of the next steps for Monument Lab, some of the conversations we've had are, you know, do we continue trying to build prototype monuments um, in exhibitions or in other kind of contexts to open up space for new narratives, to try out new things, especially outside of the idea of permanence, because very little we have is guaranteed to us as permanent, and to play with that. 
or should we figure out a way to, you know, build a monument a year and look at new partners and think about that? It's a question that we are continuing to grapple with, and I think that idea of follow through, um, although we want to keep learning, we have to really be responsible for kind of coming forth with what we said we could do, and then also trying to push that over time as well. I just like, I mean, maybe just to answer your question, I don't think Philadelphia's Assembly's goal was ever social change, per se. I don't, I don't think that's why the project was created. I think there's individual collaborators who have that goal as part of their practice, but I think that's not something that I would hang on the project. Like that's something that the project's goal was to create this network and to sort of reimagine what was possible and to reimagine how we could have these conversations and how we could hold space for that dialogue. And I think it did that absolutely. And I think it has also had the wonderful effect because like my personal goal was that it should affect the institution. So that is something that I continually active working on is how does this shift how the institution operates on a day-to-day -day basis. There's collaborators who have the goal of how does this empower particularly black voices in this space. And I think it accomplished that to certain degrees and failed at certain aspects as well. So, I, you know, much like there was a, a multitude of methodologies, there was a multitude of goals as well. Um, and I'm just very big on this whole discussion, like I, I use this phrase a lot, honesty of intent. So I, I think it would be false for me to say that like Philadelphia Symbol was about social change per se, because I don't think the project was. I think that is a wonderful thing that comes out of people who were already doing that work and were already interested in that work, who then became a part of Philadelphia Symbol. So you're saying that the network itself was focused on Yeah. Uh, so for collateral, for Symphony for a Broken Orchestra, it's it's kind of running away from us. Um, we there's a children's book, a cartoon, a feature length documentary. Um, it just kind of we're like, oh okay. Um, there's a, there's another possibility for a musician who has a, a a new album coming out called Broken Instrument who wants to work with us as a tour of professors through the country that we could partner with the different school districts as they go through to try to raise funding and awareness as they go along, that might come off. Um, so it, it, it keeps, I want to give a shout out to Judith Tannenbaum, who's got her I adopted a trombone button on. Um, that's, that's good stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of sense of the conversation continuing has, 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 left, has left the building. Um, let's see, in, ter in terms of intention, I don't know I'm the best person to answer that question. I mean, I think everybody who got involved in that project had a, had a different reason why. For some people, it was they wanted to get back to the school where they came from. For other people, it was about their kids, um, their parents that taught them. So I hope that it can be, you know, that intentionality that everybody brings to it individually, uh, that's the heart, I think. And I guess for me, um, speaking about ephemera, I was uh, very particular about it. Um, not a surprise. Um, I really wanted to approach this not thinking about, oftentimes exhibitions have monolithic images, so it's the image you see, you recognize it for the show. Because my show was so much about the multiplicity of blackness, um, I took six artists and I decided to engage them in six different ways, and a lot of it was based on how they, um, how I know them to be. So Martine loves advertising, she was all the ads. Uh, Tony is a former basketball player, he gets the, the banners, I knew he'd like those afterwards. Um, the artists that were less known, we put more money towards promotional videos that played outside of our museum. Um, Stephanie Jamison's piece was very personal about a death of a child, and that was in the gallery notes. So everyone had these very specific pieces. Khalil turned in all his photos first, so he was on the invitation cards, um, which plays a role. But then the poets themselves, um, Morgan Parker, we did a poster uh, for Towards a New, a New Theory of Negro Propaganda. Um, I was really inspired by um, Daniel Martinez's uh, 93 Whitney Biennial buttons that if you collectively put them together or some of them would say, I can never imagine wanting to be white. Uh, so I used that template and I used the line, for, the final line from um, Morgan's piece, which was inspired by something Tiana had said in the studio visit and it said, we even make chains look good. And so we did it in silver and we did it in gold and at the end of the show, um, a bunch of us got it tattooed on ourselves. Um, and so, 
that ephemera obviously will live forever, um, unless we decide to remove it. Um, but also, the poem I commissioned for Morgan is in her new book. Um, Simone told me that the poem I commissioned from her, which is collaborative with Ugly Duckling, um, inspired her brand new book, which is coming out. So I was really touched to know that those kind of had a, life, a later life. And I think social engagement, I think it just applies to many more of these practices than mine. I'm a straight up curator in a YQ gallery. Like, I'm doing a show to do, to do the show, you know? You would, you would argue, I mean, I think there's different politics of being myself in a, in a gallery space, but I think I came in wanting to do a badass show like within the history of art. That's what I wanted to do. Do we have time for one more question? Everybody out there? One in the middle. Got to reach those long hands. Um, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us. I'm just sitting in this room thinking about all the amazing people that are here and the networks that are here. And um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how much you guys talk to each other as you develop these similar or somewhat related projects, and um, if you did at all. And then as they came to as they came to be, if you had any time to visit each other or think about each other's work, um, did you take things away from each other's projects that you um, you know wish you had? Oh, we should have done a syllabus for you know for this, or like we should have um, had a uh, you know just like ins inspirations from each other's work that you um, could either. Could either have seen putting in your own project or in a future project. And if you were locked in your project for the whole time and you didn't get to see any work, it may be something that just like landed for you today. Yeah, I mean, I met everyone today. I, I never met anyone before. Um, I did see some of Monument Lab because it was open in hours that I wasn't uh, in the museum. I did have artists reach out to me to participate in Monument Lab that I wasn't able to because I was doing the, the book club. Um, and then we did, we were reached out for um, Philadelphia Assembled um, to activate the reading group at some point. Um, but we had already publicized our reading group, so I, I kept it within our museum. Okay. <laughs> I, like I said, I was aware of all this stuff, and I had the pleasure of uh, working with Paul and doing some other stuff before. So, this interest in monumentality in relation to the city, as well as Philadelphia Assembled, it was great to recognize what was going on because it did feel, at the, at, as Daniel's already described it, as sort of this critical mass. So, we, it, and I, this also builds on Paul's earlier comments about Philadelphia being a, a great culture to create these sorts of projects. So, it really felt whether it was um, fireflies down the parkway or other events that were going on in the city in addition to what we've talked about so far today. It really felt, and it continues to feel, I believe, that Philadelphia is the place to get these kind of projects to, to really stay in Florida. I'm struck tonight by um, the um, shifting tenses that we use of like the project was versus the project is. And uh, in some ways, the afterlife of each of these projects but also the deep commitment beforehand, and these were opportunities to, to air that out. You know, I think about, um, you know, like being there for several events leading up to Female for a Home, um, and then the performance of it from Temple Contemporary, that in the years that we were thinking through the project um, and the development of Monument Lab felt incredibly pushed and learned a lot from that. Um, and, you know, thinking about where we were and also where we will go, hearing everyone on this panel talk about what comes next, um, not just embodied, but um, also outward, is incredibly generative. And I share with Rob this idea of when you, and, and also Daniel too, when you walked around the city this fall, there was a kind of beautiful overlapping. There was so much public art. There was opportunities to go into museums for a number of shows that had been, um, if not unprecedented, not having the power in numbers. Um, I will say that um, you know it was hard to find time always to be outside of one's project, but the immense amount of material, conversations, publications, and ongoing work related um, allows for that to grow. And that, that power in numbers that 
projects from different institutions and venues have something to say to one another and open up conversations is something I hope we can continue with our future projects as well. I mean, I'll just say quickly that I, I can't claim any sort of ownership as like someone who created and or you know, sort of organized this project as uh, I am one of many collaborators that were in the process. So, I mean, I know some of my panelists from, from other contexts and I know there's other people who were involved in the project who have deeper relationships and sort of woven in and out through a lot of things. I mean, I think that the nature of Philadelphia is more because of how many people were involved, that there was a lot of connections to things that were already going on and around, um, you know, the, those webs went really deep into different parts of the city. So, you know, whether it's a personal relationship or, or a collaborators that have that connection, there's definitely relationships there. Yeah. Um, so, my guess is that there's a lot of people in this room who could also offer an answer to that question about how these things intersected, either in your own lives and bodies or just in your minds right now. And so I hope you stick around and chat with each other. Um, but it's 8 o'clock, so we're going to wrap up the event. But thanks to the panelists for being here. And thanks to you for being here. And I just want to give a shout out. We have, some, uh, we have a bunch of our current grad students here, but we also have a bunch of people who were just accepted into the grad program here. Woo! So welcome to you all. Um, and have a great evening. Hope to see you soon. Oh, and we have an opening on Friday, like Patty Phillips said. So uh, check it out at six o'clock if you're if you're looking for something to do. It's gonna be some great art. Have a great night and talk to you soon.